Before we get into today's interview, I wanted to provide a quick content advisory. This episode may be best to listen to without little ears nearby as some of Santa's trade secrets are discussed. Last year on Christmas Eve, Katie Hughes wrote on Instagram, I think every mom's hope on Christmas Eve is that our efforts are enough. And I'm here to tell you, regardless of how things go in the next day or so, it is enough. Because Christmas is really just an extension of what we do every day. We just love. We work hard. We try to do everything right. We stay up late. We check off lists. We prep the food. We just do our best. And we love and give and serve every day to the people that we love the most. And Christmas is just an extension, a magnification of the love we feel from a loving Heavenly Father and the gift of His Son. That's why we do it, all of it, end quote. That is the message we hope to share with you today. A perpetual business owner, Katie Hughes, has created several successful businesses from the ground up, including one in which she wholesaled women's accessories to stores across the United States. She loves growing things and continues to look for opportunities to create and share with others. Her life passion is her family, believing that love is in the details. She recently co-authored a book entitled The Gathering Home with Emily Bell Freeman and Jess Kettle. She is also a co-founder of Multiply Goodness, a nonprofit focused on empowering women to love God's word. She and her husband are the parents of five children. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Pearson, and I am so excited to have my dear friend Katie Hughes on the line with me today. Katie, welcome. Thank you so much, Morgan. It's good to be here. We're going to talk about what Emily Bell Freeman said about Katie to set the stage for our conversation. But before we ever get there, I just want to say this woman has a gift for what we're about to talk about today. And I have been the beneficiary of that gift. And so I am so, so excited to be able to learn from you, Katie, today and to have the chance to to really dig into something that I have admired about you for a long time. So to get us started, you have this gift for making any kind of gathering or occasion or celebration feel special. Emily Bell Freeman said that you are someone who can create the magic of a gathering. So my first question for you is what do you think it is that creates magic in a gathering and why is gathering so important? Such a good question. And I love the thought that Magic is really love. If we think about the word magic and put it in the framework of the word love, magic is love. And if we think about the love that's manifested in a hospitable heart, having a heart that's a gathering heart, there's something powerful if you think about that. And the magic comes as we consider the details or as we consider the things that might touch people's souls. And I'm just, have always been someone has, that has thought, you know what, if it's going to bring somebody out of their family home or away from the people that matter the very most, then we've got to make it count. And I feel like that is the magic. The magic is the love that we create, that we put into a gathering, a celebration of some sort and, and really implement it into and making an evening or something feel extra special. And if we also think of it in terms of gathering as an eternal principle, it makes it so much more meaningful. So I love the thought of the doctrine of gathering. If we think about gathering in terms of an eternal principle, we think, oh, you know, we gathered before we came to this earth. We gather here in families, we come to families, we gather in wards and we gather in stakes and we gather as a worldwide global church. There's some powerful thoughts as we think about, I think gathering is probably pretty important. And especially in third Nephi, you know, when the savior is talking about how he has gathered, how he will gather, how he will yet gather, it feels pretty important. And it feels like an eternal principle, um, a doctrine of gathering that feels like life-giving if we give it space in our lives. 
I love that. And I was just asking my seminary kids this morning, we were talking, we were studying Amos, we were talking about prophets and President Nelson. And I said, what do you think is the most important message that President Nelson has been trying to communicate? And I was thinking of hear him, but one of my seminary kids said, the gathering of Israel. And definitely that is something that President Nelson will be remembered for is that emphasis on gathering. And so if we want to follow the prophet, then we understand the importance of that gathering. Katie, I want to establish really early on in our conversation that as we talk about Thanksgiving and Christmas celebrations specifically, the goal today between you and I, and we've talked about this beforehand, is not to make anyone feel like their Christmas traditions or their celebrations are inadequate in any way. And when you guys created, when you, Emily and Jess Kettle created the Gathering Home, you talked about connection over perfection. And I love that. I wondered what does this phrase mean to you? I think this is an increasingly important phrase as we think about, you know, what's actually out there. I mean, right now, visually, we are at our peak. We are seeing things across social media channels that are just next level. And it's easy to look and be like, you know what, I I think my party needs to look just like that. And there are parts of me that want want that. I want it to look like that. I want it to feel like that. But when it comes down to it, it's all about the people. It's all about connecting hearts and it's all about connecting um, souls. And I feel like when we think about connecting, connection over perfection, that means that families and people trump whether or not it looks perfect. It trumps whether or not everything goes just so, or that we were able to order the perfect linens, or that everything came together, all the details worked together. You know, I think that that part feels uniquely special if we think about the connection with families and people being the most important thing. So I feel like that's something that almost has to be practiced because in my heart, I want it to be amazing. I want it to be beautiful. I want every detail to matter because I feel like those details show love. Love is in the details is something I've always said. And I believe that deeply. And I think some people really do have the capacity to do it all and still connect people over the perfection of what it looks like. But I think we have to practice what it feels like to gather people and to make them feel at home, make them feel welcome. And sometimes that looks like you not rushing around. It looks like you sitting and stopping in the middle of a gathering moment and really connecting people and making sure those conversations are happening and making sure that they're naturally a part of what you're working to do. Well, I I mentioned that I feel like I have been the beneficiary of your talents. And one of those was you threw me a bridal shower. And I remember like all of the beautiful things about that night. But like the thing that I will remember most for the rest of my life was you having everybody sit down and give their best marriage advice. And so while the whole night was beautiful, because it was Katie doing it, it left an impression on me because I'm like, I may not be the one who makes everything beautiful, but I can, that's like a little thing that I could do in the future to make a a bridal shower special. So I want to attest, though, because I witnessed something firsthand this year. Katie and I volunteer together with a nonprofit called Multiply Goodness, and we host this big event every year. And Katie is the mastermind behind the event planning part of it. And we had some things that like did not go perfectly. Like she says, these details where some things went kind of helter skelter and somebody came up to you, Katie, and they were telling you about something that had gone wrong. And you said, just let it go. And then the person responded, it's already gone. And I was like, Katie never seems frazzled or stressed when planning an event. And that is not a talent that I have. So I'm wondering, how do you keep from becoming stressed or letting those little things bother you? 
Well, I, I think it probably depends on the event. I think with something like that, I mean, we were completely uh, out of control. We we did not have control of the weather and what was going to happen. And unfortunately, we have a track record of crazy weather with the Jubilee. But, you know, I, I feel like there is a piece that sustains me. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with how we prepare, how we consider the things, taking time to prepare and almost put ourselves in some scenarios, I think it's worth the planning. And especially if we're thinking in context of like gathering for the holidays or things like that, it's worth the time to prepare and to consider and thoughtfully approach what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do, what is the purpose of what um, what what you hope for it to look like. Is it to just celebrate someone or is it to really connect and maybe bring people closer to Jesus Christ or, you know, I think those things are important. And as we carefully prepare and as we work to have the spirit in our lives, then we have a peace that sustains us. And that part feels really important to me in any, in any situation, as we thoughtfully approach things, we can have that spirit always with us to help us not be frazzled in any moment. So that's my thought there. For sure. Okay, Katie. So when this episode airs, the next day will be Thanksgiving. And so my guess is as many people listen to this episode, they'll either be traveling to and from family um, or they'll be prepping Thanksgiving sides. So you are a big believer in the importance of the role of Thanksgiving. What is that role in your mind? You know, I feel like Thanksgiving really readies our hearts for Christmas. I feel like there's such power in resting in letting there be a rest before it all kicks up and we're ready to roll, you know, with the holidays. I think it's powerful as things become more commercialized and, and I mean, we haven't known our lives without Thanksgiving, right? And so we think about how do we bring meaning to it? How do we bring meaning? Just, I think we think, oh, I'm, I, I'm going to use this time to be grateful or give thanks. And I love that we have a prophet who encouraged us, you know, with that hashtag give thanks a few years ago. How neat was that to see that on social media? And, but there's something powerful in letting our hearts rest to prepare um, for a season of giving. That's, that's the bottom line. And um, as we turn our hearts to us, uh, uh, our gratitude of the things that we have, the blessings we enjoy, it readies our hearts to practice Jesus in the coming season. And that feels like a really powerful part of preparing for the upcoming, you know, Christmas season. One thing that I don't know if I fully appreciated until a few years ago, I was in London on Halloween and as soon as their Halloween is over, they don't have Thanksgiving in England. And so to our European listeners, uh, we recognize that we're talking about an American holiday right now. But it was interesting to me to see as soon as the Halloween stuff was over, immediately Christmas goes up. And I was like, hang on a second. Like, to me, Thanksgiving is such an important part. And we just watched in seminary this morning, the video with President Nelson, where he talks about give thanks and the value of gratitude. And he gives that prescription for gratitude. And so I think we do, whether you celebrate Thanksgiving or not, wherever you're listening from, I think it's important to, to recognize that, that being grateful and taking a second to stop and think about all that we have and all that we've been given then prepares our hearts for Christmas. So as we shift to Christmas, Katie, you are a big believer in the ability that an, a Christmas Advent has to turn our hearts to Christ. Can you tell listeners a little bit about Advent and what it looks like in your home? Yes. I first want to just quickly hop on what you said earlier about, you know, our European um, brothers and sisters who jump right into Christmas. I mean, I love that. I love that. And, you know, I think it's wonderful because there's so much time between, you know, Halloween and Christmas to ready a heart. And so I think it can work in all the ways. And 
Advent is one such holiday that, that does that. And I think as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we grew up with maybe a countdown to Christmas. We may have had Advent calendars where you opened something each day, that type of thing. But Advent is really this connective holiday the world over that connects Christians to an anticipation of the Savior coming on Christmas Day. And um, I, I did not grow up with the knowledge of this. I, I wish I would have. And so I am, I love engaging, you know, my family, those I interact with and teaching them about Advent. And Advent is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And so the four Sundays before Christmas, often people will have like a candle holder or an Advent wreath where you light a candle each Sunday. So that first Sunday you light the candle. And then the second Sunday, you're going to light that first candle and the second candle. Third Sunday, all three candles. And the fourth Sunday, um, all four candles. And it's an anticipation of the coming of Him. And there is something connective as we turn our hearts to our whole global community of celebrating Jesus Christ, um, there is something powerful in that holiday and they're in the practice of Advent. And, you know, um, there's so many resources out there. There's Advent books and um, cards you can buy and things that can feel like it can connect us to what we're working to do as a global community, but I just feel like even in homes, what does that look like as we ready our hearts for him? What does it look like to stop on a Sunday and light a candle together? It feels special as you think about everyone else stopping, lighting a candle in the busyness of the season to turn our hearts to him. It feels like almost covenantal to me. It feels like something we do, you know, almost like the sacrament. I know it's not like that, but it's a stopping and it's a turning and it's readying our heart, you know, to jump into a new week and to prepare our hearts for him. So Katie, follow up question on that. Do you in your home, because I know there are different ways to do it. You know, you can do the the once a week or you can do like a daily thing. Do you all just do something on Sunday or do you do something throughout the week as well? Yeah, it's both for us. So every Sunday we really try to make an effort to to light that candle with our brothers and sisters. And people are doing this in churches, in their big, beautiful churches every Sunday. This is a part of their worship. And so we kind of make it a part of our family worship, like our come follow me time that we really enjoy. Usually it's around family dinner. Um, and But we're not always like at our home for family dinner, but we do try to do it each Sunday. And then um, during the week, we're always finding ways that we I mean, we still have those countdowns that we open each day, or we still have those things that we read each day. They bring our family together to think of Him. So it's both. It's both in our family. And I think there's room for any and all. I think this can look like any way you want it to, and you can decide what works for you in your family. I love that. It feels like a very doable thing. So I think it's awesome. Another thing that you have said has made your Christmases really special is participating in Light the World. I wondered if you would mind sharing any of your favorite memories or sweetest experiences that you've had in doing Light the World. I love the Light the World initiative. I feel like I've probably done it from the beginning in Arizona when I was living in Arizona. And now as I've moved here, it feels like an extra special thing for me. And I, I will tell you, I, I am one of those ones that kind of prepares in advance Christmas. Like I'll start thinking about it in August and think about my Christmas cards and what that might look like. And I, I know that seems silly, but because Christmas to me is such a turning to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that it feels like the anticipation of it needs a little bit of thoughtful planning and practice. So I do prepare a lot of my things in advance. I'm not saying like I'm ahead of the game and all the things. There's constantly things that I'm still working on during the Christmas season. But for the most part, I try to 
try to get a lot of the things done so that when light the world hits, I am, there is space in my life to listen to the spirit. That's the bottom line. And, you know, over the years, light the world has kind of transformed. It used to be, you know, you would get the prompts from the calendar and you would do that one thing. And I, I've loved those prompts and I've tried to follow them when I could. But I loved last year, they made it so you could make your own calendar and kind of decide what you wanted to do where. And even this year, I haven't seen a calendar come across. And I think I I just prefer that so much more because it gives space for the, the spirit to work within us. And um, I think my sweetest light the world moments have been those times when I've followed the spirit and I've had that prompting to to do something or to offer up something and, or even prepare or plan something. I think if I look at my holiday calendar, I think about, okay, there are some things that are specific to certain days. Like, um, you know, uh, we have a neighborhood service project that usually happens after the first presidency devotional. It's a, it's, we just connect together, um, over hot chocolate and a bonfire and we just get together. Those that want to come in our neighborhood come and we've all donated gift cards for refugee families. And it's just a connective neighborhood type thing. So like that's on the calendar. There are certain things that are like become on the calendar because they're planned out. It's what we've planned for within the month of December. But I love that there's all these other days to be able to create the season I want. And I hope, I always hope that season is going to be one focused on loving others. And so some of my favorite light the world experiences have been the drop everything and go do something type experience because I felt like that prompting or I saw a need and I worked to fill a need or my very sweetest ones are the ones that happen within my own home. I think we think We've got to get out there and do some good when really within the walls of my own home have been the sweetest when it's sometimes I'll stop and tidy my kids' rooms or and leave a little note. Like, I know you're trying so hard, like in the middle of this semester and all the things you're working to do. I love you. I see you. Keep going. Those are the things. Or even just a home-cooked meal in the middle of December sometimes feels really hard. And so taking the time to make something special, even maybe light a candle right in the middle of December. Yes, on the weeknight when things are busy and everyone's every which direction, um, that feels special even times when I've been able to do something for my husband. And sometimes that looks like cleaning my side of the closet because his is so clean and mine isn't. And sometimes the service is stopping to see how I could bless his life and help in some way. And so I've had so many neat experiences through this year and I, the years, and I, I almost don't dare not do it now because my seasons are so filled with him. Um, and, and it's never perfect and it's always messy, but it's super special. And it really is maybe more, um, I would say selfish (laughs) more than anything, because we know what happens when we serve and when we love and when we extend, we are so filled and it makes my season so much more meaningful. So well said. Thank you so much. I couldn't help but wonder because I have known you for a while now and have gotten a little bit of a taste through social media, not only of your immediate family, but of your extended family as well. Your parents, Katie, were big gatherers as well. So I wondered what did the holidays look like for you growing up and what have you carried into your own family from the way that they did things and what have you left behind? I love this question and I love every chance to honor my amazing parents. They are super special and have always had gathering hearts. And we had a second home that they opened up to people all the time, mostly in summer for parties and gatherings and things. But they taught me about that gathering heart. They taught me about 
anything that's mine is yours. Anything I have, if I have 50 extra linens that I could lend you, absolutely. If I have centerpieces that could be used for someone's this or that, you got it. And that gathering heart feels like like it's been passed on for me and, and really a lot of my family members. And I think, I think, like I mentioned earlier, this, this kind of can be practiced. It can be taught and it can be learned. And I think with my parents, they, they taught me so much. Our holidays were really the perfect mix of Christ and claws. That's the best way to put it. Um, I know some people don't love Santa Claus, but I love what I think Elder Faust said once that Santa Claus really emulates the Savior. So if we can have one more symbol that brings us closer to sa- the Savior, then then that's okay. But they had such a good mix of making the magic with Santa Claus. I remember there was one year I got to tell the story. It's too too good. So it was like my second grade year. And I really wanted a Cabbage Patch doll. And I didn't want just a Cabbage Patch doll of any kind. I wanted a specific one like the preemie babies because they were so cute. They were bald-headed babies that were the absolute cutest. And I am just positive my mom, within the you know great expanse of all the responsibilities she had at the time, probably tried to find me one but couldn't. And I remember waking up Christmas morning and seeing a more mature cabbage patch doll with red yarn hair. And I remember not identifying with this, uh, this doll at all, not thinking this is not the gift I wanted. And I'm sure my parents saw my disappointment in my probably eight, eight year old little heart and eyes. And my mom and dad had gone the distance of having a, a letter, um, that was accompanying the present and it was written in beautiful cursive and it was from Santa Claus. And the best part is it was not in English. It was not in English. It was in French and nobody in my home spoke French at all. And so my mom and dad and their wisdom said, who speaks French? Who could possibly, you know, tell us what's in this letter? And she had this great idea that our next door neighbor, Paul, who was many, many years older than me, could could translate this letter to me from Santa. And this darling letter, I went over to Paul Christensen's home next door, and he translated this letter. And he said, Santa said to me, you know, Oh, I know you wanted this other doll. I left this uh, the doll you wanted with a girl in France, and you got her doll. Can you please like this doll? And it was everything. It was everything I needed to make me love that doll. And he was going so fast, he forgot that he was writing. He was speaking in English or French instead of English. And I have treasured that little letter my whole life. And of course, it's Paul who wrote the letter uh, in the first (laughs) place. (laughs) And, um, but I thought, oh, the distance they went to help keep the magic alive and help me, I don't know, just help me believe in this magic, you know, which to me, like I said, connects us to Jesus in, in all the ways. This love we feel, this magic we feel is really love. And my mom and dad, multiple ways through the years, brought us to Jesus. There was always a story. There was always a way to serve. There was always a way to love that was different than throughout the year. And our Christmas Eve is meaningful, like many families out there, completely focused on Jesus. And then lately, in anticipation of Santa, And this is the part that's so fun. We get in our pajamas after we've done all the Christmas story and all the giving and the loving. And we get in our pajamas and we come out of our room and we have a pajama parade. And this is such a fun tradition and kind of just, again, turns our heart to that magic part. So it's just, it's both. 
it's been both through the years and I'm grateful for their example and for their lives that, um, that have always taught me of like the love and the goodness of the world and that magic and, and, and Jesus. I love that. And for the record, the pictures and videos from the pajama parade are a highlight of my Christmas. So (laughs) thank you for sharing that. You said something once, Katie, that really touched me. You talked about how things evolve and they need to change. And as a result of that, we have to recognize that some traditions may not last forever, which can be hard for some people to let go of things from the past and, and you know, create their own new traditions. You said knowing this makes you want to treasure the season that you're in. How would you say, Katie, that you've learned this and how have your your holiday traditions evolved and changed depending on the season? Oh, that's such a good question. And I feel like it's almost like we have to consciously think about what we're doing. I mean, we shouldn't just ever do traditions just to do traditions. Well, it's just what we always do. Like, what right. is the purpose behind it? And we need to be thinking about, is this really gathering best is this how we should gather best or what could we do more to connect how we should and need to connect? And sometimes there's just those fun, silly traditions that feel like, you know, let's just keep them. We've always done it. But I, I actually believe in the practice of looking at something and considering it and then thinking, you know, how could we leave space for something new? I think it's 100% okay for there to be specific times when you can do things. And then for us to be able to say, you know what, time's gone. And now when we close that door, there's now room for new opportunities to create memories. And I think sometimes we can get lost in the redundance. We can get lost Mm -hmm. in what looks like, oh, it's just the same old thing at so-and-so's house. Well, what if we change that up and we look, look at it each year? I think... For the sake of tradition, we think we've just got to keep doing it. But what happens when we close the door on something, it means there's space to do something else that might be more meaningful and might be just what we need. For me, something that's um, that's been really special is celebrating Santa Lucia. This is a um, Norwegian, well, Swedish holiday, Scandinavian type holiday that it represents this Lucia who was this bringer of light. And I would have never even thought to implement this without doing some family history work. And my oldest daughter, Ruby, took this class at BYU where she was finding these ancestors and engaging in the stories. And all of a sudden now we have space in our family tradition where we, my girls dress up in Santa Lucia robes and the red sashes and candlelight on their head and we welcome in um this morning and it's so powerful for our family and now we can't we can't live without it and it feels connected to my ancestors and it also feels meaningful for our family this is only like maybe seven years we've been doing this now and so i love the thought of of looking at those and and putting some aside that are, are not needful and giving space for new things that can bring new light and new joy. Absolutely. I think it's interesting to hear that perspective as I'm, we're just starting our family. So it's good to, good to hear. Are there any other Christmas traditions, Katie, that you feel like have especially helped turn your family's heart to Christ that you want to mention? If not, we can totally skip over that one. (laughs) There's so many. I, I did want to kind of simplify this a little bit. And I, I had the thought, um, music is a Christmas tradition in whatever way that looks like for me, it's been the Handel's Messiah participating in that through the years. I don't even know if they do that after we've moved back from um, Arizona, but they used to do that. And that was so neat where we could participate in Handel's Messiah singing for my family personally in the millennial choirs and orchestra, which is a five state choir. Um, that has been so powerful. Music is a tradition. And so in whatever way that looks like for us to implement, and it might just be the tradition of turning on the music in our home and every, every Sunday, making sure we are 
focused on those. And it's not just that the cute and the fun, but it's that holy music that brings us close to him. The tradition of music feels really impactful for our family. Obviously, like the sights and the sounds and all of that can bring us to him. And I, there's a book I have, and, and I wanted to put this in there. If you think about, you know, that star that you're cutting out of your cookie dough or hanging on your tree, all these like commercial type parts of Christmas, if they're not leading us to Jesus in some way, leading us to Bethlehem in some way, then it's a Christmas without Christ. So the traditions I have are always those that are leading us to the Savior. And so it might be the cookie dough and the cookies and all of that, but they're symbols that represent the story of Him. And so my favorite traditions are those ones that that are pointing us to Him. I love that you brought up music because I feel like that's always been a big part of our family's Christmas. Growing up, my great grandpa played the guitar and sang. And at our family Christmas party, he would always break out the guitar and everybody would sing. And still now, despite the fact that he's not there with his guitar, there's always singing. And then my mom has like the Reader's Digest Christmas song book. And she always will play the play the songs out of that. And, and that's a huge part. And I actually thought of this earlier when you were talking about, you know, making sure that Christ is a part of Christmas and that that's part of what brings the magic. That's part of what brings, makes it worth celebrating. That's what we're celebrating. And just yesterday, my mom sent me a song. I don't know, Katie, are you familiar with the Christian artist? She's kind of new, Ann Wilson. No. Okay. So my mom is like her biggest fan. And she sent me this song yesterday. And the chorus of the song is just so pretty. And I wanted to share just a little bit of this. So the chorus says, For God so loved this broken world, he sent his only son to a carpenter and a teenage girl to show us all his love. He left his home in heaven to make heaven my home. My Emmanuel is with me and I'll never be alone. Down here, my heart can't find much to believe in, but I still believe in Christmas. And the song goes on and it just is like, that is when we say we believe in Christmas, we're saying we believe in Christ. And I just love that idea so much. Um, Katie, before we get to our last question, I wanted to ask you, I think one thing sometimes in the hustle and bustle of the Christmas season that can get lost is stillness and taking time to actually think and ponder and, um, turn to Christ in a quiet way. So how do you make time for stillness in the middle of the Christmas season? One of my favorite quotes says that peace, um, it does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. And I love that as we think about having a calm in our heart. I have this little plaque and it just says all is calm. And I see that when I come in and I think about that holy night and I think about the power of even childbirth and welcoming a new baby. And lots of times our Christmases almost feel like a childbirth experience. We anticipate all the things and then Christmas morning we have everything to show for it, you know, and there are these beautiful, powerful moments we can have within our season that bring the calm. And I, I consciously make an effort to bring the calm. And that's a little bit with my readying before in advance. I think, I think if we leave things to the last minute, we feel frazzled and we feel like we're never going to catch up and there's just not time. And, and, um, I mean, that won't mean anyone, anything to anyone that hasn't done that yet. And they're listening to the day before Thanksgiving. But I think, I think though we can make a practice of trying to shift our minds to, like I said, accomplishing what we can in the short time that we have so that we leave space for that. I feel like that can be so important. So for me, those stillness moments really happen in the, in the evening after everyone's kind of gone to bed, um, or in the early morning, I I had this really wise, wonderful, productive woman tell me once 
she actually had this plaque on her wall and it said, the only way to get more done in the day is to steal a few hours from the night. And although I love this <laughs> and, and believe it in many ways, I also really need my sleep and I need my rest, you know, but I have found in the quiet moments of the morning before my household is awake and the evening, once I put my house to sleep, sitting by the tree and reading my scriptures or just pondering on the day and and all of that feels like so special to me that's how i find there's something about the lights in the darkness um in in a dark morning or a dark night and to have those lights and to sit those are my gathering places and those are the places where i feel stillness even even um we can be doing something highly productive um we might be let's say shopping um we might be uh putting together gifts or something but if i have my airpods in and i'm listening to the first presidency devotional that i missed or something else you know i think gosh we can really find moments of rest within the craziness that help us constantly you know turn back to him and um i feel like there's there's time for stillness if we if we if we look it's just carving out the time and being intentional in that time together. I kind of alluded to this, but I love taking a date night with my husband right smack in the middle of December where he's not expecting it. And it's almost like this still moment for ourselves. It's like a collective breath where we together are, okay, we've got this right smack in the middle of December. It's, it's busy. We've got lots behind us. We've got some, you know, yet ahead, but this stop and rest moment feels good. I think come follow me can be that way for us. As we gather in family prayer, read a scripture, there are restful moments if we look for them. And I think we, it needs to be enough for us. It needs to be enough for us. What we, what we establish together needs to be enough to help get us through. And there are multiple times within the season when we can do this. For sure. And I think too, you know, when you're talking about shopping, I had the thought we can bring restful moments to other people in the middle of all of the craziness, like just asking the cashier at the grocery store, like, how are you doing? You know, and actually seeming like you genuinely care. I've noticed brings, it's almost like, oh, you actually are asking about me and you don't have to do that. And so I think that's big. I also, when you were talking about, you know, preparing early just this weekend, my husband was like, can we, can we put out the nativities now? And I was like, sure, we can put out the nativities. And, um, he has a nativity that he bought years ago in Jerusalem and he's been hanging on to it for his future home. It had never been taken out of the oh, wrapping and it. it's just like brought a sweet spirit into our home this weekend. And so I do think like, preparing our hearts, preparing our homes early, we get to enjoy it a little bit longer. And and why shouldn't we want that? Katie, yes. you have shared so many wonderful thoughts, and I feel even more excited for Christmas, which I'm always excited about. I love <laughs> Christmas. But Katie, my last question for you is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I love this question. I love what other people have shared. For me, it means loving him most. And I think if we look at the things of this world and recognize there's so many, so much out there, so much information, so many ways to love others and give room and space for people. But really what it comes down to is loving him most. And that means keeping his commandments. That means trying again. That means working to walk his covenant path. It means, of course, giving space for all those people that need ways to feel an added measure of love. But when we love him most, that that feels like what he asks of us. And I feel like we everything else kind of falls together. When we love him most, everything else figures itself out. And being all in, feels to me like a constant choice 
to turn to him and choose him each day. Katie, thank you so much. It has been so wonderful to to spend this time and hopefully hopefully it's helped other people as they're in the middle of Thanksgiving preparations to feel a little bit more of the spirit of this season that I think is such a gift to all of us. And if we, if we just become caught up in the secular parts of it, then we miss the beautiful parts and the the parts that bring the most joy. So Katie, thank you so, so much. Thanks so much for having me, Morgan. A huge thank you to Katie Hughes for joining us on today's episode. You can find The Gathering Home in Deseret Bookstores now. Big thanks to Derek Campbell of Mix It Six Studios for his help with this episode. And thank you for listening. We hope that you have a happy Thanksgiving and we'll be with you again next week.